you guys may have uh, heard that Friday our pastor tested positive for COVID and he had had a giant meeting with all the staff except for Whitney you know good job good to have Whitney back isn't it what a blessing God answers prayer so all the staff is not sick but they have all got to stay home and so uh, I talked to um, Tim Friday I he called me when I was um, I buried my uncle this week my, this weekend my dad's brother was 77 and uh, Pete Morris and we have a uh, tradition in our family We have a big family dad's one of ten kids I have 38 first cousins which is why my wife the pianist here is uh, from Montana make sure we're not con related um, But when someone dies in our family, we all get together, all the men, and we dig the grave. And we talk bad about the person that we're going to bury and tell jokes and uh, tell stories and remember their life. It's a family tradition. Well, Tim called me in the middle of that, so I told him what I was doing. I sent him a picture again. That's what we're doing. Talk as long as you want, Tim. <laughs> the only time I tell him that. Um, because I need the break. Then a few hours later, I hear he had COVID, so I called him, and he didn't answer. But he sent me a text. He said, don't start on my hole yet. <laughs> so I said, we have to vote on that as a church anyway, so no problem. Um, but I, I'm sure the reason he didn't answer my call is because he was calling all the other people who could do this first. And uh, he got to my name finally, and I said yes. So uh, I really... Uh, I want to share this verse from John chapter 3, verse 14 and verse 15. If you want to look there, um, I can't even begin to tell you how important this verse is to me. Um, it really changed a lot as far as my, uh, my understanding of salvation and what it means and how it is a con what actually saves us. John chapter 3, verse 14. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the, wild, in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, God, just for a chance to come together. I pray that you would bless this time. Lord, I pray that you would give me the words to speak, but more importantly, God, that you would speak, that your word would speak, that the Holy Spirit would lead. God, I pray that... You would do a work, God, that only you can do. And help us, God, to turn our eyes and our attention and our focus and our hope and our affections to the cross, Lord. In Jesus' name. So when I read this verse 20 years ago or so, I had never really looked to see the story of Moses and the serpent. So I want us to look, if you can go to Numbers chapter 21. Verse 4 through 9. I'm getting um, to that point where I need help. Got to tell you, we, uh, we were at the drugstore, um, and my wife was trying these on, and I tried on a pair, and Felt like God healed me of blindness. It was amazing. <laughs> like a Benny Hinn concert. Um, I was I was really I was reading prescriptions on the back and the ingredients on the label, so it was amazing. So um, Numbers chapter twenty one verse four they traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. 
the people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake, put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake, put it up on a pole, and then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. If there's anything that just jumps off the pages of this scripture and really all of scripture, is that sin brings death. We've seen it from the book of Genesis and the Garden of Eden. We know from Romans that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. I want you to look at the sin that these people committed, and it helps to have some context always, and I'll reference a lot of stuff from this entire book, especially chapter 20. But they were on their way to the promised land. God had already delivered them from Pharaoh. They had already gone through the Red Sea. They were getting really close to finally being there after, you know, the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. They had just had a victory, destroyed the last people they fought, and now they were almost to where they were going. They had to go through the land of Edom but the king of Edom said, no, you will not pass through here. Now, this was the most direct route that they could take to where they were going. In fact, it was called the king's highway. I mean, that's what, that's what the scripture refers to as the king's highway. It was a straight shot to where they needed to be. He said, you will not pass. And he had gathered his army at the border, and Moses had to lead them the long way around. And so they began to doubt Moses. They begin to doubt God. In fact, some would say they came really close to speaking blasphemy because they said of God, you've brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert. Attributing the good work of God to some evil plan. They had spoken against Moses, the man of God, the guy that was leading them from the beginning. They slandered God. They slandered Moses. I just want to say something about that real quick, because you may miss it unless you have recently read through Numbers. Moses had just lost his brother, Aaron, just like my dad just lost his brother. Aaron was literally his right-hand man. When he said, I can't go to Pharaoh because I can't speak, God said, well, I'll let you take Aaron, and Aaron will be your mouthpiece. He will speak for you. Just a few verses before Aaron passed away, Moses had lost his sister Miriam, the one who also was a partner in ministry and wrote the song of praise after they had gone through the Red Sea. Look what God did by the hand of Moses and Drown the Pharaoh army. It's a beautiful, beautiful praise song that she wrote. Pastors are people too. My dad was a pastor, is a pastor, and my grandfather was a pastor. We know from today that Tim is sick. Pastors have families. They have they have funerals. They have ups and downs. And be careful. Man, we all know to be careful to speak against the word of God and to slander God's word. I'll just throw this in for free. Be careful when you slander the man of God, too. And everybody's made mistakes. I'm just saying, people who reject God's word usually reject the man who brings God's word. And finally, they rejected the manna from heaven. This, is, this was a the craziest one to me because this food literally came from heaven it fell from the sky they found it for free they didn't have to work for it and they complained God you we have no bread 
and a few verses later, all we have is this light bread. I mean, come on. You're so ungrateful. They said, we have no water. And just a few verses before, Moses had hit the rock and water had come from it. And all I can say from Scripture, we're pretty safe to say that none of this went over very well with God because he sent fiery serpents and people began to die and death entered the camp. And all of a sudden, whatever hand of protection was on that people was lifted. And they had a change of heart. And they, they went to Moses and they confessed to their credit. Moses, we have sinned when we spoke against the Lord and, and, and you too. Imagine that was hard to do. And they prayed for salvation. Moses please pray to God to take these snakes away. They, they had no, no way to defend themselves. They were everywhere. God's plan that he gave to Moses brought life. Now, I would say this is a strange plan. Moses was told to make a snake and put it on a pole. It wasn't very long ago that they were all in trouble for making a golden calf. So why God's plan doesn't always make sense to us and I will say there's a lot of theological questions that I may bring up today that I can't answer but Tim will if you call him he'll have some answers by Sunday I'll have all kind of people calling him so but I don't mind that because I'm just filling in right seriously um, some people have speculated that God chose a snake because well some would say just because there were snakes biting some have said because when God chose Moses to be the leader, he had to prove it by throwing his staff down and it became a snake and it swallowed the other snakes in the court of Pharaoh and then beat the magicians and proved that he was God's man to lead. Some say it goes all the way back to Genesis where the snake deceived Eve and Adam. And what did the snake do? Did God really say that? And he slandered the word of God to Adam and Eve. And so God makes this plan. And look, there's nothing more to this story except look at it and they will live. It's almost like out of all the instructions that God had given them and they would messed up and they messed up. He, in my, in my reading of this, he just made it so easy. He said, this is the simplest instruction I can give you. Just look at it. If you believe me, look at it and you will live. It, it could not get simpler than that. And he did not add anything to it. He didn't say, all right, look at the serpent on the pole and then start a plant-based diet or start a push-ups at the gym or start. Yeah, you can laugh. I'm laughing. I'm picking on Stephen LeBay. I'll say it. Um, but he did not add, go take two aspirin and, and call me in the morning after you look at the snake. He did, didn't add a, a series of steps. They looked, and they lived. And this is one of the most difficult things for a lot of people to receive. John 1 says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. John 3, 14, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. Everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Jesus is talking about his crucifixion. He's talking about when he is lifted up between heaven and earth to pay for our sins. And he points to this story that says, look and live. Now, that's too easy. That's too, uh, that's too simple. There's a whole lot more. There's always more. But what actually saves you? I promise you, it's the plan of God that brings life. And the serpent has bitten every person who's ever been born, even Nicodemus, who was asking him in John 3, what must I do to be saved? How? Jesus said, you must be born again. Nicodemus doesn't get it. Well, can I, I'm an old man. How can I be born again? Re-enter my mother's womb? Jesus says, no, that which is born of flesh is flesh. What is born of spirit is spirit. And then just a few verses later, just like Moses lifted the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up, 
And if we didn't know what that meant for sure, there's a few passages where the disciple says that when he said that, he was signifying what kind of death he was going to die. You know, the cross is so much more than just a symbol. We have, I've got a few verses here. Look into Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Christ redeemed us, Galatians, from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. First Peter, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and to live and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. God's plan is simple. Jesus died on the cross in your place and in my place. He couldn't lower the standards because we had sinned against God. Max Licato says, um, the crosses, the arms go wide, but the beam goes vertical. As God couldn't lower his standard, but all were welcome. He writes it better than I say it. When I was seven years old, my grandpa's church in Tullis, Louisiana, I was paying no attention at all to the service. Then the preacher started preaching about the cross and painted a picture of Calvary with the two thieves on each side and his arms open wide and that it was for me. And I knew even at that young age that I had sinned, I knew that I was carrying that weight and I felt the call of Christ and I walked forward that day and I never, I never doubted that was the day that God saved me. I, I, like the song says, at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burdens of my soul rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I'm happy all the day. But I will tell you, I struggled. My cousin Sambo is here on the front row. He helped me dig the grave. I struggled with uh, salvation. He always picks on me. He says, I'm in the will or out of the will, depending on if he likes me right now or not. But I felt like my relationship with God was like that. It was, he loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not, depending on what I've done. But it's not by works of righteousness that he saved us, but by his grace and mercy. He did the work. And when we look to the cross, although we know that he died and rose again, it is at the cross where we are reconciled by God. It is a symbol that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That he who knew no sin became sin for us. We stand in that righteousness when we stand in the presence of God. He literally shielded between heaven and earth. He shielded us from the death. We, Psalmist talks about the shadow of death. We, we were standing under that shadow, but we didn't feel it. Some people have given criticism to this story, Numbers, because uh, it's like idolatry. Uh, it's a serpent on a pole. And some people are critical of the cross because, oh, it's, people have made it an idol. I would say it's not an idol. It's a symbol of the love of a real God who really loved us. This is what whole John 3 is about, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. He didn't send his son to condemn the world, but that the world will be saved through him. Many of us know this to be true when we're saved, but we, we lose sight of it. I had, I had a job this week, uh, a couple weeks ago now, and when the customer, my customer called me, my customer is a gas company, and they said, you got to do this job down by New Orleans, and this guy is, uh, this guy is a hard customer. Kirk, do you know any hard customers? Yeah. 
I tell you, they told me he's belligerent. He's unreasonable. He's a tree hugger. But we don't want to go do the job because he's so crazy about this tree down there. And we don't want to go get in trouble, but we got to put the gas line in next to it. And that's what I, I do some of that near live oak trees. I do preservation stuff. And so I go down there. I'm expecting this guy to be just in orbit. But he listens to what I explain. He signs off on it. And I get the job. A week later, I'm down there get, put, putting this trench in. So because I'm a glutton for punishment, I just like to poke a bear, I guess. I said, what's the story on this tree? What, what's so special about it? So he begins to tell me, he said, when my daughter was born, this man's 75, when my daughter was born, her grandpa, my dad, bought this tree and planted it. It was 12 years old when we planted it, so as soon as she was big enough, we put a swing in it. They have a little bitty backyard, and that was her playground. She played, got a little older, they built a tree house. He would sit and watch while she played in their yard. When she was 11, she was killed in a car crash. Now the guy doesn't seem so crazy to me. And I watched him every morning I was there. And he'd wake up, he'd come out with his cup of coffee and go sit in the shade of that tree look at it remember I know he knows that's just a tree but when he looks at it he sees her life and her death the relationship they had the love they had it means a lot to him it's the same way with this behind me. This just two pieces of wood. But what does it mean to you? More importantly, can you see it from where you are? When's the last time you sat in the shade of the cross? Thought about your relationship with God? You know, there's a lot of applications to this sermon. I think that there are many of us who like those Israelites, we, we question God's plan. We, we maybe stop short of slandering his word, but we question where we're at and the direction that we're in. Complain about the provisions that God has given. Maybe even complain about the man of God. All of that is healed and all of that is sobbed in the cross. I think sometimes we need to remember where God brought us from, where we were when he saved, who we were before he saved us. And I'll be willing to bet that there's somebody here today who's never just taken that moment to say, God, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. And I need you to save me. And I'm trusted not in what I can do, but your death, and your burial, your resurrection. The work that you did on the cross, God, that, that's the reason I can go to heaven. Please save me. It's not a magic formula. It's not an incantation. But you've got to be looking steadfastly, looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. I'm going to ask Dana to play. Eric, you can come up and sing. I'm not sure where you are today, but uh, I'm going to ask you to come. I know when I sit over here on this side, I can't see the cross. I wonder if you can still see it from where you are. And I don't just mean physically. When's the last time you said, kneeled and prayed in God? God, I thank you for your death. I thank you for the life that you've given me in you. 
I know we all need to come and pray for God to give us direction. I know we all need to come and pray for our staff and pastors because they're sick.